this particular issue has become a hot topic because if you fail to address Medicare's interests, it can lead to, uh, at worst, the Department of Justice coming after your firm. Uh, uh, at best, it can lead to legal malpractice claims. So it's vitally important to have a good understanding of the MSP compliance issues and also the processes. And so today's presentation will address all of those issues and hopefully give you a better understanding of the issues at hand when you're dealing with Medicare secondary payer compliance. So the biggest threat here is the Department of Justice pursuing your firm. And so on this slide, you'll see there are two recent instances of that. And, and the Medicare has become uh, a lot more sophisticated with the information that they get from um, mandatory insurer reporting uh, by defendants when cases are settled. So Medicare now has uh, information at their fingertips and are very serious about pursuing firms for failing to reimburse Medicare. So in these two instances, uh, both the law firms were pursued by the Department of Justice and ultimately settled. Um, and as part of those settlements, both agreed to have a uh, Medicare compliance uh, process within their law firms. And really that's at, at the heart of the matter, you need to have that for your firm because the risk of not having it is so great that it simply is not worth it. So either you do it yourself or you outsource to a firm like Synergy who can help make sure that you are MSP compliant. So the the case that gave rise to the Maryland issue, which I had on the previous slide, um, is memorialized on this slide, the fact pattern. So I wanted to go through it because it's instructive. Um, so in this particular situation, the law firm settled a medical malpractice case involving a Medicare beneficiary that provided notice to Medicare of the settlement they got a conditional payment letter which indicated the lien amount as being $14,990. Uh, the law firm relied upon that figure to settle the case. So I'm gonna stop right there. Does anyone see a problem there? Well, the problem is, is that conditional payment letters cannot be relied upon. So the fatal error that the law firm made here was relying upon a conditional payment letter. So they relied upon the conditional payment letter, they settled the case and notified Medicare of the settlement. 60 days thereafter, they got a final demand for $330,000. So they subsequently filed an administrative appeal because there's multiple layers of internal appeal processes that you have to exhaust when you are disputing a Medicare conditional payment. Um, they got denied. Um, in the meantime, it got referred over to the Department of Justice. Um, a letter was sent demanding payment and the law firm turned the matter over to their ENO carrier who paid a reduced amount. But still, that's a horrific situation to find your firm in. So you wanna make sure that you avoid those kinds of situations. And the best way to avoid it is, is to have an understanding of all the issues involved. So what I wanted to talk about real briefly before getting into the nuts and bolts of Medicare secondary payer compliance are the different types of government benefits that clients can have when they are disabled. And it, it's important to know the distinctions because most oftentimes clients confuse these and uh, it, it really is something that you have to become a bit of a detective and make sure you understand exactly what they're receiving. So if they are receiving needs-based or income and asset sensitive benefits, those are gonna be the Medicaid program and the SSI program. And there is a connection in most states between the two. And, most states, if you get $1 of SSI, you automatically get Medicaid. 
those types of benefits are income and asset sensitive, so you got to be careful about giving clients the money outright. The entitlements are SSDI and Medicare, and there is a connection between those two. So the way people get Medicare coverage prior to reaching retirement age is by being disabled under the Social Security definition of disability and qualifying for SSDI. So SSI and SSDI are both Social Security benefits, which is why frequently clients confuse the two, but SSDI is an entitlement, and if they get qualified for SSD, that means they're going to be a Medicare beneficiary within 30 months. And that's when you've got to deal with all the issues that I'm going to talk about today involving the Medicare Secondary Payer Act. So according to Medicare, there are two different obligations under the Medicare Secondary Payer Act. One is uh, resolving any payments that Medicare made prior to the date of settlement and up through to the date of settlement. Those are conditional payments, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then the corresponding issue is any payments Medicare might make after the date of settlement, that's the Medicare set aside or future interest issue. And then Section 111 reporting is the mandatory insurer reporting that I talked about, which is where defendants have to report any settlements of $1,000 or greater to Medicare if it involves a current Medicare beneficiary. And they report a whole host of information, including ICD codes, dates of accident. Um, and it's really important to understand that that process can impact your Medicare conditional payment uh, final demands. It could impact the client's ability to access Medicare after the case is resolved. So mandatory insurer reporting and you having an understanding of what is being reported is vitally important. And there are ways that our company can assist to make sure that uh, the issues that can revolve around mandatory insurer reporting are are properly addressed, but part of that is on you in that you've got to coordinate with the other side to make sure you understand exactly what's being reported. So I wanted to go through the conditional payment process step by step because it's really important that these steps are followed correctly because if not, then what happened with the case I identified at the beginning of the presentation is very possible. So in terms of just an overview of the process, the first step is reporting the case to BCRC. After that, they'll issue a rights and responsibilities letter. Uh, after that, um, you get the opportunity to dispute unrelated charges. So once that CPL is issued, that's the time to say, hey, there's some care on here that's unrelated, remove it. Uh, once the case settles, you send notice to uh, BCRC and they will issue a final demand. That final demand is the only thing you can rely upon. Anything prior to that, the numbers are not finalized. You can see a change up until you settle the case and they issue that final demand. Once the final demand gets issued, then interest accrues if it's not paid and it's referred over to Treasury for collection thereafter. So you can get a copy of this presentation by requesting it uh, through Synergy's website or through a Synergy sales representative. And there are hyperlinks to these different forms within this presentation that you should be using. So I would encourage you to get a copy of this presentation. So when you are starting out with a Medicare beneficiary, uh, you want to make sure that you get a proof of rep uh, signed by the client and also a consent to release. And these, these forms are also available on Medicare's website, so you can always go there. So that's step one. Step two is providing notice to BCRC of the case. You can do it by phone or you can do it by mail. And the slide has the information for that. So after you've provided notice, 14 days thereafter, Medicare will respond. If you don't get a response in that time frame, you need to contact Medicare because it means that they probably did not get your correspondence in, in the notice. So uh, you, you should follow up. But you want to make sure that 
everything that's in the rights and responsibilities letter is correct. Um, so you need to make sure that if you don't get this letter, you've done that resubmit of the documentation from step one or step two of the notice. So after you get the rights and responsibilities letter, all future correspondence with Medicare should use their correspondence cover sheet, which again, there's a hyperlink on the slide to find that. But you can also find it on Medicare's website. Because if you don't use that, you can run into problems. So within 65 days of receiving the rights and responsibilities letter, you'll get a conditional payment summary that will list all the claims related to the injuries, and that's where you want to audit that and make sure that the provider names, diagnosis codes, uh, dates, total charges are all correct. And that's where if there's unrelated care, you need to then inform Medicare that there's unrelated care and go through disputing it. So when you do that, you, you want to make sure you tell Medicare which claims are not related and why. Um, you want to provide medical records to support anything that you're disputing. Make sure that you don't use a highlighter in terms of uh, what you are sending back to Medicare. If you're sending back the um, conditional payment summary, uh, if you highlight things, it's not going to show up. And you want to make sure you use that correspondence cover sheet. Now, one of the things I wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of is that there is a way to get a final conditional payment from Medicare prior to settling the case. So um, you are allowed to do that if you take the following actions. You have to notify the BCRC that you are within 120 days of settlement. Uh, so you have to resolve your the, the case within that 120 day period. You request your final uh, conditional payment amount within that 120 day period. Uh, but you have to settle your case within three business days for requesting that final conditional payment amount. Um, and then you must finally submit settlement information within 30 calendar days. So another useful tool uh, for trying to figure out conditional payments is also the Medicare Secondary Payer Recovery Portal. Uh, through the portal online, you can see what Medicare has paid. Again, because Medicare is only bound by the final demand. The only alternative to that is this final CP action uh, process. So that's really your only two alternatives. So if you go through the normal process, you'll get a final conditional payment letter. That's the, the final uh, demand. So um, you once you get that, that's where you are going to be ready to uh, ready to resolve the case. So uh, this process, this final conditional payment process, is a bit different. So you will get this in place of a final demand letter. So it's a little bit different process. You should go through the Medicare website to familiarize yourself with this process if you plan to use it. So if you go through the normal process, you get that final demand letter. Um, so the way you get that is you're advising Medicare that the case is resolved. You downloaded the final settlement detail document and provided all the information back to Medicare. So once you've settled uh, the matter and you've gotten your final demand, then it's time to calculate what Medicare is owed. And there's two different uh, Code of Federal Regulation provisions that govern. Uh, the first is 411.37, which basically uh, allows for a procurement reduction when Medicare payments are less than the judgment or settlement. Um, so if Medicare payments are equal to or exceed the judgment, uh, that's where potentially Medicare is going to uh, get the entirety of the settlement proceeds less than cost. So, uh, you want to make sure you are using the correct calculation. So once you get the final demand, uh, you, you've got to pay that amount within 60 days or it accrues interest. If you request an appeal or a waiver through Medicare, that does not toll the interest. 
and interest is due and payable for each 30-day period if the debt remains unresolved. And all payments made to Medicare are applied to interest first, principal second. Once Medicare does get final payment, uh, Medicare will send a letter stating that the lien has been reduced to zero and the case is closed. And that's when you know you are done and complete. So I wanna talk about the different methods of resolving conditional payments. We just talked about the norm, which is going through the process and paying the final demand. Um, so that would be pay the amount after audit verification. That's just the first way of dealing with Medicare conditional payments. The second way is to appeal the amount due to Medicare. Uh, that is a lengthy process because there's multiple layers of appeal within Medicare itself before you ever get to a district court. All the while, if you don't pay the final demand, interest continues to accrue at a pretty high rate. So typically speaking, the appeal process is not going to be one that makes a lot of sense. The most uh, beneficial to the client method of resolution is pay the final demand and request a compromise or waiver. And there's three different ways to request this. Uh, or three different provisions that allow for you to request it. First is a financial hardship waiver under Section 1870C. So this is where you can make arguments that it would be financially uh, burdensome for the client to pay back Medicare because they are in a financial hardship situation. Um, they've got severe financial circumstances. Uh, so as an example, a uh, waiver might be appropriate if a beneficiary, Medicare beneficiary became le legally responsible for their grandchildren, right? They're, they're taking care of their, their child's kids. And th this actually comes from a specific case that we handled where we requested a hardship waiver. And Medicare, actually in that case, granted the full waiver of the Medicare conditional payment in that circumstance. She was also a Medicaid recipient, and being a Medicaid recipient automatically um, indicates a, a hardship, right? A financial hardship. Uh, next is compromise, and the compromise basically is um, a methodology where you can argue the cost of collection doesn't justify the enforced collection, there's an inability to pay, um, chances of successful litigation litigation were questionable. Um, that's why the client sell it for less than full value. So basically, you can make equitable arguments under the compromise provision. Um, and CMS is the one that determines whether they grant that compromise or not. And the last one is sort of a catch-all, which is best interest of the program waiver under Section 1862B. Um, so under that provision, Medicare can simply waive uh, if it's in the best interest of the program to do so. So assuming you use that one of these methodologies and request a, uh, a final demand, pay it, and seek compromise or waiver, if you're successful and they grant the waiver, then Medicare will simply refund all or part of the conditional payment, depending on whether they are uh, granting a partial compromise or full waiver. So we do this routinely, day in, day out, in our lien resolution group. 76% uh, of the time, we get money back from Medicare. Uh, last year, we recovered $1.1 million. The average refund last year was in excess of $20,000. Since we began offering this service, uh, it's recovered $5.3 million. And many of our competitors say, oh, you cannot do this. It, there's no way to get money back from Medicare. But we do every day. And the image is actually a copy of a, a real check that a client got back from Medicare. It does work. It's very effective. And it's usually the best way to deal with reducing a Medicare conditional payment where you have the appropriate arguments to make. One question that comes up quite often is, can a hospital refuse to bill Medicare? And the answer is yes, they can choose to stand on their lien rights. Uh, but Medicare 
interprets their regulations to mean that after one year, that hospital no longer can uh, assert a lien directly from, to the beneficiary or from the settlement. So, uh, but as always, you know, hospitals are only entitled to the reasonable amount that they're due. And we do have a service that allows you to quantify that by just getting a report that uh, goes through the hospital billing to determine what exactly are the reasonable charges. So this, uh, this is a very important part of the presentation. Uh, it's, it's an area that is now becoming uh, heavily litigated by Medicare Advantage plans. And Medicare Advantage plans are Part C plans or MAOs are a different animal. And when you contact Medicare, Medicare does not have information about these plans because they're, uh, they are private insurance companies. And more and more clients are opting into Medicare Advantage plans. So you'll see on this chart, uh, it's going up rapidly. Uh, so the Advantage plans are going to be administered by a Blue Cross Blue Shield, United Healthcare, Aetna, uh, could be a variety of different insurers. Um, they are basically taking parts A, B, and D of Medicare coverage, rolling them into a privately administered policy that's paid for with Medicare dollars. Uh, but the important thing to note is the last bullet point on this slide is that the MAOs use the Medicare Secondary Payer Act as their recovery vehicle. So I call these hidden liens because they are truly hidden if you don't know how to find them. Uh, so as I said, Medicare, if you call them, they're not going to tell you how much a Medicare Advantage plan is going to be asserting a lien for because they don't know. They do not have that information. So a, a tip off to a situation where you have a, a client who has elected into an Advantage plan is you contact Medicare, you know that there's been quite a bit of medical expenses incurred throughout the case, and Medicare says we have zero as our final demand or a very low final demand amount. That's where it's very likely that a Medicare Advantage plan has paid dollars for your client's care and will have a lien against the settlement. And there is a provision within the Medicare Secondary Payer Act that allows for a private cause of action for double the amount of the Medicare Advantage lien if there's a failure to reimburse. And that provision is extended from Medicare to these Medicare Advantage plans by the Code of Federal Regulations. And worse yet, there are provisions that allow for recovery directly against you and your law firm. Uh, the Humana versus Paris Blank case uh, is a case that we were assisting a law firm where that was exactly what happened. An Advantage plan pursued the law firm for double the amount of the lien, which the lien amount was $191,000. Uh, ultimately, it was resolved with Humana, but they were very aggressive. Um, and Humana and all these other Advantage plans have been litigating this issue uh, and in the 11th circuit, my home circuit, Humana went after a property and casualty insurer, Western, Western Heritage, because there was a failure to reimburse the Medicare Advantage plan after settlement. And the 11th circuit said Humana was entitled to double damages because the Medicare regs and Medicare uh, Secondary Payer Act says shall be double the amount of the lien in these instances. So you've got to be very careful with these advantage plans and these hidden liens to make sure that you address the uh, reimbursement rights of the advantage plan. Our lien resolution group averages uh, almost 60% reductions on these MAO plans. Uh, they're, they're either going to have to rely on the Medicare uh, reduction formulas, the CFRs I went through in the Medicare um, CP resolution process earlier on in the presentation, uh, and honor the, the compromise and waiver request. 
or they're, they got to be subject to state law, uh, state law subrogation laws. So uh, you, you got to make sure that you are pursuing these these liens and resolving them and have a process within your firms to identify them and then make sure you're getting the appropriate reduction through the resolution method. So real quickly, I wanted to talk a little bit about our lien resolution services. Uh, since I just spent a bunch of time talking about uh, Medicare conditional payments and Medicare Advantage liens, you may be thinking uh, this is an area fraught with danger. You know, is there someone we can turn to? Our lien resolution services are designed to help personal injury firms deal with the ever-changing landscape of subrogation, including Medicare, uh, highly successful in getting money uh, recovered $101 million uh, through last year in savings based on lien resolution techniques we use, 50 plus years of subrogation experience on our staff, and we continue to add to the depth of our staff. Uh, our fees are based on the level of success that we achieve, so it's percentage of savings. Therefore, we, we're, we're fighting liens, and everybody within our lien resolution group is incentivized through their compensation. Uh, to get the largest possible reduction. Uh, our pricing for Medicare resolution is audit verification, which is basically review of Medicare conditional payments, making sure that everything's related and resolving it with Medicare through the traditional process. It's flat fee. It's $750 for settlements under $100,000, $1,250 for over $100K. If we're doing Medicare compromise or waiver or Medicare Advantage liens, we do 15% of, of savings achieved. So if the client doesn't see a reduction in their lien, they don't pay us anything. So if you're interested in outsourcing liens, the next step would be an intake presentation for your law firm and a synergy sales representative can arrange for that. So the last topic is the dealing with futures. And if you remember at the beginning of the presentation, I said Medicare interprets the Secondary Payer Act as uh, requiring two different things. One, pay back Medicare for any payments made prior to the date of settlement. And then the other is this MSA issue. So from date of settlement forward is what we're talking about now. Medicare's position on set-asides comes from their interpretation of the MSP, which precludes Medicare from making payments when there is available insurance coverage to pay for medical, which is workers' comp, liability insurance, no fault insurance. So the current landscape is that Medicare does not have regulations or statutes that require Medicare set aside. But as you'll see on this slide, there's a, a picture of uh, the website from OMB where Medicare has begun the rulemaking process for regulation with Medicare set-asides. This is something Medicare is serious about and they have the information to enforce. So it is coming. So the question right now is what do you do? So one of the, the, the first key points is that since there is no law requiring it right now, it's analogous to special needs trusts where you've got a Medicaid recipient that you're giving settlement monies to. In that instance, you've got to tell that client, hey, if you're on Medicaid, you may want to set up a special needs trust because you could lose Medicaid if you don't. Same thing with Medicare these days. You've got to tell the client, if you don't set anything aside, there is a chance Medicare might deny future injury-related care. The defendant's going to report your, your case to them when the case is settled. They're going to have the diagnosis codes. There is a risk. One of the things to, to remember about this is that you only have to worry about this if you are representing a current Medicare beneficiary, so someone that's disabled, over 65, has end-stage renal disease or ALS, or is an adult disabled child, or someone that's got a reasonable expectation of becoming a Medicare beneficiary, meaning that they are on SSDI. So once they are receiving SSDI within 24 months, they, they become a Medicare beneficiary. But one of the other key points too is that when I talk about Medicare set-asides, there is no requirement to do a Medicare set-aside. 
what you're supposed to avoid is shifting the burden to Medicare when a settlement is paying the client for future medical care. So you can do other things. For example, the client could elect into one of those Medicare Advantage plans. Arguably, the MAOs do not have a right to insist upon a set-aside because there is no regulation or statute that they could rely upon since these are uh, creatures of CMS policy currently. They could elect, a client could elect to get private insurance, they could self-pay, they could set up a trust for future medical or a structured settlement. So there are alternatives. And two, there, there may be instances where uh, there are arguments and a legal argument as to why there should be nothing done at all, there should be nothing set aside. And I'll, I'll talk about that before we end today's presentation. So if a client is Medicare eligible, they are gonna need to treat in the future for their injuries, and the settlement includes future medical dollars, that's when you want to consider either setting up an MSA or an alternative or doing an analysis and documenting as to why nothing is being done at all. You gotta do one of those three things currently. But the MSA, the actual formal establishment of the Medicare set-aside is CMS's preferred method to protect the trust fund. And all an MSA is, is it's basically a deductible. It's a calculation based on the client's life expectancy and future medical needs and that is a dollar figure and that amount is set aside and the client has to spend that prior to Medicare expending any dollars for any future injury related care. So when it comes to the Medicare Secondary Payer Act in general and all of these issues, you wanna make sure that you start early and, and get data from the client about their public benefits if they're disabled. You wanna make sure that you are controlling this process from start to finish. You don't ever want to rely upon uh, the other side's experts as it relates to MSP compliance issues. You gotta, gotta be proactive about this and, and make sure you're protecting your client. But when that case settles, you've gotta make sure that the correct data gets reported to Medicare under that mandatory insurer reporting because if you don't, there's a lot of consequences. One, you could have a new final demand issued if they report the wrong date of accident. You could see Medicare denying the wrong care if a unrelated condition gets reported to Medicare. So there's all sorts of risks and you wanna make sure that you document whatever the other side ultimately is gonna report. And then two, you, you've gotta develop a process internally in your firm to identify cases with Medicare clients. And if you have a Medicare client, then you wanna determine if future medicals are being funded by that settlement. If they are, then you've got to educate the client on the risks of failing to set aside anything and then select the appropriate solution for that client if they are uh, concerned about the potential loss of their Medicare eligibility for injury-related care. So I developed an acronym for this, um, which is CAD, which is consult experts, advise the client about the MSP, and then document your file. That last one, documenting your file is so important. The client says, you know what, give me my money, I don't care about any of this. You wanna just document, have them sign a, an acknowledgement and a waiver. We do have templates for that, uh, which we can provide to your firm, or you can hire us to do a consultation with the client. And if they decide they don't wanna do anything, then you've done everything possible to protect yourself and protect your firm. So one thing I wanted to, to mention prior to to finishing up on this topic, which is uh, there are situations where you just simply can't set aside enough money because there's not enough money being paid by the insurance carrier. So if you've got a million dollars in future medical, but policy limits are 100 grand, obviously you can't set aside a million. So one of the services we offer is a reduction methodology, which is what this slide illustrates. So in this case, it was a half million dollar settlement. There was an MSA proposed by the defendant of $116,000. We did a reduction formula. Uh, we came up with a reduced amount of 7,198. So that was a 93.8% reduction of the MSA amount, which resulted in $100,000 in savings to the client that they could use for 
things other than their Medicare future uh, covered services. So when it comes to, to this area, I, it really is invaluable to have a partner like us. There are, are other companies out there I think we have a set of services that are unique and are end to end. So you know, we can handle the liens, we can handle these sorts of MSP compliance issues. So you have a partner that can provide a level of service that is unmatched in the industry. So we can handle everything from consulting with the client to actual funding solutions. If there's uh, going to be an MSA, uh, we can do the allocation, which is the, the calculation of the amount that should be set aside, and then ultimately set up a trust to professionally administer that MSA. In terms of our pricing, we offer an MSA evaluation and consult, which is a $500 fee. If we are hired to do an allocation, it's $2,000. If we do that reduction analysis that I just mentioned, it's an additional $500. We also offer a non-Medicare expense report, which quantifies what would, would not be covered by Medicare, and then also just a simple medical cost projection, uh, $1,500 for the non-Medicare expense, $2,000 for medic, medical cost projection. So again, if you want to outsource, these sorts of functions, the next step is doing an in-tech presentation for your firm. So the last thing to talk about to, to wrap up total MSP compliance is dealing with clients that are dual eligible. So those are clients that are eligible for Medicare, but also get Medicaid. So in those instances, Medicare is primary and Medicaid will pay co-pays, deductibles, and Part D costs. So if you set up an MSA for a client like that, then if you don't put it inside of a special needs trust, it will cause them to become ineligible for Medicaid and SSI. So you wanna make sure that you are planning for that type of client to make sure that all their benefits are uh, taken into account and protected. We have uh, quite a few different trust solutions for clients that are on different types of public assistance. So we've got the solutions for those that are dual eligible, so Medicare, Medicaid, but also for clients that are just on Medicaid, as well as clients who just need a trust. And in some instances, those clients are ones where they may be entitled to some type of government assistance in the future, and there's a need to make sure that there's flexibility and a plan in place to qualify later down the road, and that's where settlement trust can be invaluable as well as using it in conjunction with structured settlements to protect that client from being preyed upon by companies that try to purchase structured settlements. So that's it. Uh, I wanted to briefly tell you all the things that Synergy does. So obviously talked a lot about lien resolution, Medicare secondary payer compliance today. Part of what we do is consulting on settlements, making sure that all government benefits are preserved, we have a settlement planning department that offers structured settlements and other financial products to protect the personal injury settlement. Uh, we offer trust services and then ultimately tax deferral of legal fees. So if you want to contact us, our toll free number is on this slide and also take a look at our website to learn more about how Synergy can help you. Thank you.